Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is May the 4th, 2020. Let's talk boxing. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, this video is really directed to gamblers. Because of the coronavirus, because of the lockdown, I believe you're going to have more upsets than usual in the fall. Right? First, let's talk about the elephant in the room. And if you have inside information, which I don't have, then I'm hoping you leave this information in the comment section of this video. How does drug testing work during a coronavirus lockdown? Are the drug testing people actually knocking on your door and watching you give a sample? Because we know if they don't watch you give the sample, history has shown that athletes will have Uncle Bob, Cousin Fred, you know, Entourage member Jim, give them a vial of urine for testing. Right? I know this subject matter is gross. Talking about it here online makes me queasy. But it matters because we're in a sport where some of the elite fighters have been busted for using performance enhancing substances. Right? Canelo right now was busted for clenbuterol. There's always a cover story. Dylan White was busted earlier in his career. People forget Dylan White was actually suspended for a period of time. Then, of course, there's the cloudy sample A, sample B drug test later in his career. Right? This is the world we live in. Guys have been busted. We're finding out now that some historical fights involved guys who may have taken performance-enhancing drugs. I like to point to the Shane Mosley Oscar De La Hoya rematch. Now understand the way PEDs work. If I'm an athlete and they tell me, hey, you know what, we're not going to test you for three months or four months. Right? For whatever reason. Coronavirus, whatever. Then that gives me the opportunity to take PEDs to build up my muscles. And then if I'm smart and if the PEDs are water-based, right? Or if I'm smart and I'm taking EPO and I'm building up my cardiovascular and I know EPO is going to flow through my system, then by the time they get around to test me, I'm clean. I'm practically ivory soap clean. So what I want people to do is to look at the fighters who they feel are a bit too muscular. Right? The fighters who are physical specimens and then you have to ask yourself the question, are they all natural? I can tell you years ago, one of the sport's best pound for pound was in a fight. And after the fight, they did some drug testing, and they determined that the epitestosterone testosterone level of his opponent was elevated. It was so off the page that they were going to fail the guy for a failed drug test. But then, of course, they found that the favorite, the known fighter in the fight, his epitestosterone testosterone ratio was also off the page. Understand, you have a little bit of a culture clash going on. I lived through the 1990s in baseball. In fact, as I like to tell people, because this is provable, re-watch the 1988 World Series, the Kirk Gibson game. When Jose Canseco comes to the plate for his last at-bat, the L.A. crowd, this is an 80s crowd, the L.A. crowd starts yelling steroids, 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 right? There was a time when we saw athletes, right? The NFL draft. You would look at guys, suddenly their senior year, their numbers would pop. You'd look at guys, they would 
look much more muscular than they did their freshman year. Some of these guys got picked early in the draft. Tony Mandrich comes to mind. Right? Got picked early in the draft. And then, of course, you watch the guy's career. The more the NFL drug tested, the more the guy lost weight. Even today, I look at some of these former NFL linemen. And they're barely recognizable. They've lost that much weight. They've lost the weight around their neck since they stopped playing. So PED use, to me, is much bigger than we want to believe. Some of these guys get therapeutic use exemptions. Right? You might remember Lamont Peterson's defense when he was busted with testosterone-enhancing substances was that a doctor prescribed it to him right the same pressures that led some baseball superstars to use the cream in the clear or to visit with doctors who were located in strip malls for substances that same pressure is present in boxing so forgive me I'm a cynic some of these matches, I'm going to be looking at these guys knowing that because of the coronavirus, they weren't able to be around their trainer. They weren't able to be around sparring partners. They weren't able to be around a big gym. Right? And as I make this video, I learned a few moments ago, Gold's Gym is declaring bankruptcy. Right? Gyms weren't open. So you have guys who weren't able to work out, but yet I'm guessing they're going to look like Tommy Morrison. A guy who juiced back in the day. Right? Think about how Tommy Morrison changed history. Didn't he fight people like George Foreman? Would Tommy Morrison have beaten George Foreman if he were clean? I think that question is going to remain unanswered. So you have to ask yourself, who are the likely juicers? You have to look at a map. You have to figure out, okay, which areas had coronavirus lockdowns here in the states understand you know you had some big lockdowns in places like California right guess what California still under lockdown I can tell you that firsthand whereas other states are open today in addition to the advantage that the possible use of the break to take performance enhancing drugs might have given some athletes you need to also think about the money involved right if you're a champion have been a champion for years and you're living in a mansion someplace you might have your own set of weights you might have a gym in your house you might be able to spend lockdown periods working out right some of these guys have live-in cooks they could have an arrangement where you know they have a live-in cook continuing to give them nutritious foods that's gonna help them in their professional careers but I'm just telling you and I know this I've looked at contracts I've looked at you know, documents from the Boxing Commission. I actually pay attention to how much people are getting paid. Most fighters aren't wealthy. Right? Most of them aren't. So for the up-and-coming fighter, in other words, the struggling fighter, right, the fighter who's gotten advances from people like managers, in other words, loans, from managers and stuff like that. The fighter living on loans might not have the gym in their house. Right? Whereas the superstar has a team and has a chef and is getting food through the chef. Right? And the chef, you know, whatever the chef wants, the chef's able to get. They have a supply chain. Struggling fighters, like the rest of us, might have to deal with supermarkets that don't have toilet paper. 
right? You don't get there at 7.30 in the morning. There's no steak. Right? Struggling fighters live in a, living in struggling situations. During this lockdown, might not have been able to work out, might not have been able to have eaten properly. All of this matters, folks, when you're betting on a fight. You have to figure stuff out. Understand, too, the way life really works. A lot of these guys need the paycheck. So, they don't have the luxury of saying, you know what, I'm going to pass on this opportunity because, quite frankly, this stay-at-home order had me with, you know, my family, my three-year-old, my four-year-old. I wasn't in the gym. I wasn't sparring. I wasn't eating properly. Um, if they were in a state like New York, New York City area, or California, Santa Clara County area, Bay Area, right? These athletes may not have even had the opportunity to do road work. Right? You have a setup now where people are snitching on other people saying, hey, guess what, law enforcement, my neighbor broke the lockout. Let's also think about the fighters themselves. Now you have guys, you have guys who are self-motivated. They're hungry. They're always working out. Nobody has to tell the fighter, you need to eat right. You need to be in shape. You know the guy is always going to make weight. But then you got guys like Adrian Broner. You got guys like Gervonta Davis, don't you? These are talented guys. Make no mistake. They're world-class talent. But because of their gifts, eating right and making weight haven't really been the priority that they are for the overachiever, right? Understand, you have a lot of talented guys in this sport who underachieve, right? They have the skills, they have the ability, they have the punch, they have the defensive skills. And so they don't work as hard. So you have people around them, right? Trainers who are pushing them, who are saying, give me one more lap, right? Come on, you can make it through this hill, right? You got people around them who are saying, no, 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 back away from the buffet table. You know, hey, no, no dessert for my fighter. Right, hey, player, let's get rid of the ice cream and let's have you eat apple slices and stuff that is more calorie friendly. Right, folks, without the coronavirus lockdown, this is a sport where in high profile fights, fighters have blown weigh ins. This is a sport, think Danny Jacobs. He's fighting Canelo and there's a huge penalty, right? More than half a million dollars if he fails to do some interim weigh-in between the official weigh-in and the fight. And he walked away from the money. He couldn't even keep the official weigh-in weight just to get the hundreds of thousands of extra dollars. So that's the sport. So in some of the fights coming up, you need to look at the athlete and you need to say, wow, is this the kind of guy who kept himself in shape during a lockdown? Gervonta Davis, according to a rumor, is going to fight Leo Santa Cruz. Now you know that Leo Santa Cruz is high volume. You know he's very physical. 
You know, you've watched many wars of attrition involving Leo Santa Cruz, where the other guy's hanging with him for seven, eight rounds, then the other guy just wilts, can't maintain the pace. Santa Cruz is always in great shape. Santa Cruz is prepared to fight you three minutes a round for 12 rounds. Right? I don't worry about Leo Santa Cruz making weight. That's a given. I don't worry about Leo Santa Cruz taking the sport seriously. I do with Gervonta Davis. Now folks are going to tell me that Gervonta Davis was in a lockdown on, on his own. Right? A guy who has had problems making weight without the lockdown with a trainer and people like that around him. You're telling me that now with a lockdown where he's on his own, I'm supposed to expect him to be in shape, be dedicated, do road work, do calisthenics, do jumping jacks and stuff like that. So what I want people to do is to look at fights like that. You're going to have to make hard decisions. I'm not trying to be anybody's friend here. I'm just saying, look, if you know a guy, you know, throws 95 miles an hour, is talented, but isn't dedicated. Right? Isn't, isn't dedicated. Then you might want to think, if you get decent odds, that his opponent, who, if the opponent is one of these gym rats. If the opponent is from a boxing family, as many boxers are, where dad was a boxer, dad's a trainer. In other words, the guy's with his family during lockdown, and guess what? His father knows the value of the guy eating right, working out. Understand some great fighters. Marvin Hagler famously said, look, you know, it's hard to get up in the morning when you're sleeping under silk sheets. Right, Hagler, a fighter's fighter, a guy who was always in shape, a guy who was prepared to fight you every second of every round. Right, a guy who you never saw huffing and puffing, even when he's throwing big time power punches against Thomas the Hitman Hearns in a free-for-all. There's never a second of that three-round fight where Marvin Hagler looks winded. That Marvin Hagler admitted that boxers reach a certain point in their careers where they don't want to do all the work anymore. Right? They're not going to, you know, do road work at six in the morning anymore. Right? So think it through. Let's also talk about the two fights that to me, are must-watch, right? These are the two most intriguing fights to me as we come back off the break. Does anyone here really know who Daniel Du Bois is? Is he the future? And we're hearing stories about him sparring with the best, him dropping Anthony Joshua in sparring. Right? Is he that guy? Because he's facing Joe Joyce in a major fight. Joe's in his mid-30s. He can't afford to lose. Right? Joe's also very crafty. Understand, Joyce has been through a number of trainers, but yet keeps improving and keeps winning. Now, the thing with being young, believe it or not, I was in my early 20s at one time is you don't know what you don't know. Right? Triple D, as Dubois is called, might not have a clue what it's like to be in a firefight late in a 12-rounder and need to win rounds on the scorecard when you can't KO the other guy. Right? There's a troubling sequence. It's very troubling. 
the Richard Lardy fight, where Lardy lures Triple D into a shootout. And to me, Triple D looks winded. He looks more tired than Marvin Hagler did at any time in Hagler's career. Right? Triple D looks tired. Triple D doesn't look like he's defensively blessed when he's tired. He gets hit with some Lardy shots. Now, of course, Triple D has the punch. So he takes out Lardy and knockouts cause amnesia. Right after the fight, everyone's saying, oh, we won by KO. And you're thinking, man, you know, that that third round was interesting. You know, <laughs> you're remembering the opponent landing some shots. You're remembering the winner with his mouth open, huffing and puffing a bit. But nobody else remembers that. Understand, too, Joe Joyce fascinates me. He hits hard. He's a latecomer to the sport. A lot of these latecomers have distinct advantages, right? Sergio Martinez, Anthony Joshua, right? A lot of these latecomers come to the sport and they recognize the value of discipline, the value of watching your diet and stuff like that. Latecomers study other fighters because they know that they don't know it all. That they have to figure it out. They're not living off punching power or whatever. Boxing is equivalent of a fastball. They understand that there's more to the sport than that. So they pay attention. Let me also say too. Between the two groups. Younger gifted fighters. And the older late comer who's had to learn the sport, who has been changing trainers, who has been adding things to their arsenal. I'll just say, during a coronavirus lockdown without supervision, I think the latecomer to the sport, who's older, who has a maturity about him, right, who also as an amateur went to the Olympics, represented the United Kingdom, medaled at the Olympics. It wasn't a gold medal, but hell, any medal at the Olympics is an accomplishment. I think that guy would have a distinct advantage over the young lion who now doesn't have his team around him and who has time on his hands. Right? Pay attention to the age dynamic in some of these fights. Let me also say this too. And I'll agree, this guy has gotten himself in trouble before. I'll agree, this guy checked some of boxing's wrong boxes. Right? He was busted taking uh, a substance that wasn't permitted for weight loss purposes. This guy has had weight problems in the past. Billy Joe Saunders. Right? Boxing bad boy. In interviews, it's Russian roulette with him. Right? You, you wonder, is he going to say something controversial here? Is he going to do something silly? Which he did recently in downplaying domestic violence and stuff like that. Right? Look, I know Billy Joe Saunders doesn't get it. I understand that. I know he's a car crash. I understand he's clueless, right? What I also understand is that he has the opportunity of a lifetime against Saul Alvarez if that fight goes forward. Folks, that fight is much more interesting than Canelo against Triple G, right? Understand, Triple G just came off getting beaten up by Sergei Derevianchenko. I know officially someone's going to look and say, oh, come on, he won the decision. Like hell he did. Right? I know I know he won the decision on the scorecards turned in by the judges. Come on now. All, all I'm asking people to do, all I'm asking people to do is to watch the fight. Okay? That's, that's all. You know, score the fight yourself. I'm sure some of you Scored the fight for Triple G. 
in any distribution, any statistical distribution, right, they're going to be tails, right, as Nassim Taleb says, there'll be some fat tails out there, right, you're going to have some people at different parts of the distribution, let's just say in the ring, I thought the fighters themselves knew, I thought Derevianchenko knew, that he was doing better than Triple G, they interviewed Jonathan Banks. Understand, this is the same Jonathan Banks who was in Vladimir Klitschko's corner. <laughs> right? They interviewed Jonathan Banks, a guy who's been involved in some big fights. And let's just say he could say, oh, my guy definitely won the fight. Right? He was talking about how, you know, young guys, a young guy like Derevianchenko is going to give an older fighter like Triple G problems. Well, you know, Derevianchenko is not that young, folks. Look at the calendar. Isn't, isn't he in his 30s? So I believe the Triple G people understand the basic truth. Triple G is no longer prime Triple G. Right? The tip-off. Understand, he's one of the best middleweight champions in history. But yet he fights Steve Rolls as, at a catchweight. Right, no, 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 no. The fight where I'm going to think that there is a distinct possibility of an upset is going to be the Billy Joe Saunders versus Canelo fight. I think Saunders moves too well. I think Saunders is the kind of vet who understands positioning. Right, the lateral movement with Saunders is excellent. I saw Sir Sergei Kovalev. A guy who's not a back foot jabber. Keep Canelo at bay for several rounds. Now, there again, knockouts cause amnesia, right? All we remember is Canelo decking Kovalev and winning the fight. We forget that Canelo during that fight had to take a round off. And understand, Sergei Kovalev on his back foot is like Anthony Joshua on his back foot. It's new for him. He was fighting a different fight style. It wasn't a life style for him. It is for Billy Joe Saunders. Billy Joe Saunders is asleep. Moves better than Kovalev. Billy Joe Saunders' movers are keying off dynamics. The rest of us don't see. When your game involves movement, Popping a jab, timing, making sure that you pull the jab back and can defend yourself, or watching the other guy and knowing when to throw the jab. When your game involves those things, right, hiding that you're throwing a jab, changing the rhythm of the fight, making sure that punishing body punchers like Canelo don't get close enough to you to hit you in the body. Right, you show me the mover and I'll show you a guy who knows how to get his body out of harm's way. That's the Billy Joe Saunders game. Now, I'll agree. Right, I'll agree. I'm terrified of the thought of Billy Joe Saunders being unsupervised during a coronavirus lockdown. That terrifies me. Right, I get the feeling... Between the two guys, Canelo's going to keep himself in better shape and Canelo's going to be looking at fight films and stuff like that more than Billy Joe Saunders. Right? Okay. Okay, fair enough. But that's a fight I'm looking at. I think Saunders has a real shot at the upset. One of the biggest questions in that fight will be what kind of shape does Saunders show up in? If you're looking at the weigh-in and Saunders doesn't look thirsty, you know, can actually stand on his own two feet, doesn't show up leaning on somebody, looking dehydrated, looking like he just lost a lot of weight, like Danny Jacobs looked for the Canelo weigh-in. If Saunders shows up looking healthy, ooh, I think boxing's future might change. Understand. If Saunders beats Canelo, 
there's a lot of unfinished business at 168 pounds. Right? That's one of the biggest opportunities in the sport of boxing, isn't it? You got David Benavides. You got Callum Smith. You got the guy from Tennessee. I'm forgetting his name right now. Let's just say Caleb Plant. Let's just say the winner of the Canelo Billy Joe Saunders fight, and it might be Billy Joe, could segue. Could say, okay, look, I've beaten Canelo. Um, even if they have a rematch clause. Understand, some guys aren't going to exercise that rematch clause. They're going to take time off. Right? So let's say Saunders beats Canelo and Canelo decides to take time off. Right? Saunders could easily say, hey, I'm going to fight Callum Smith. Guess what, folks? People don't realize this. Saunders is still unbeaten as I make this video. Callum Smith is unbeaten as I make this video. Right? Caleb Plant is unbeaten as I make this video. Right? David Benavides, I believe he's also unbeaten. You know, history is weird. Where in the moment you think, oh, Canelo is obviously the better fighter than Billy Joe Saunders. Canelo deserves to be the favorite in the fight. But I'm just telling you that can change quickly. Right? A fighter can go from being unbeaten, like Deontay Wilder was, to having people question his entire resume after a loss. If Billy Joe Saunders beats Canelo, he has several multi-million dollar fights in front of him. I think he'd beat Benavides, quite frankly. I think he beats Callum Smith. Right? Just those two fights and a Canelo rematch would set him up for retirement. Let me also say, too, there are other fighters in the mix. Understand, there's a lot of unfinished business in boxing. Who's the best at 175? Canelo looked around. He looked left. He saw Baturbia. If he looked right, he saw Bivol. He said, you know what? I'm getting out of this division. Right? You have other guys. Groves Dick at 175. I look at the guys at 168. I still don't know how Callum Smith makes weight at 168. Now I believe Bivol, <clears throat> because of volume, because of relentlessness, because of body punching, right? Because of age. I believe Bivol can beat everyone at 168. Right? It'd be interesting but I think Bivol can. Now the question is whether he can deal with the psychological component of fighting Baturbiev. I think Andre Ward put it best. Baturbiev was fighting Grovesdick. And in the middle of that fight, after watching Baturbiev trying to walk down Grovesdick repeatedly, Ward on the air said, you know, this has a certain big brother little brother feel to it. Right? Baturbiev makes you his little brother. Now, Bivol has beaten everyone he's faced. Unbeaten fighter, he made Jean Pascal look bad. Right? He's much higher volume and he's faster handed than Baturbiev. Is he, going to be ho is he going to be able to hold up against Baturbiev's relentless onslaught? Right? Baturbiev is going to be on his front foot throughout that fight. Understand, there's an age gap too. Baturbiev is mid-30s. Right? He's much older. He's much older than Bivol. Also, Bivol. Bivol was so desperate for fights, at one point he offered to drop down to 168. We know Baturbiev can't. The question is, can Baturbiev comfortably make weight at 175? So let's fasten our seatbelts. I know here online we've been talking a lot about the welterweight division. 
right? No question about it. That division is loaded. Crawford, Pacquiao, uh, Ortiz, Spence, uh, Thurman, uh, countless others. Sean Porter, right? Danny Garcia. But what I want people to do is to realize that 168 and 175 have a lot of unfinished business, right? Danny Jacobs is now at 168. I don't see how Demetrius Andre can stay at 160. I think he's going to be staying at 168, right? I think boxing is going to be tremendous when it comes back from the break. But before you bet on fights, you need to ask yourself, was the fighter in a coronavirus lockdown? Is the fighter affluent enough to have a gym in his house? Is he dedicated enough to eat right when no one's watching? Does he look like a guy who, at any point in his life, juiced? Understand, PEDs, that's a complicated story. You have different performance enhancing drugs that do different things. Some build muscle. Others, like EPO, are stamina enhancers for the night of the fight. Others help you lose weight to make weight. Right? You need to ask yourself, the people who take things to increase their muscle mass, and again, too many people have been busted to mention all of them here. Right? You need to ask yourself, wow, was this guy tested at all during the coronavirus lockdown? If you know VADA's testing protocol for the lockdown, please leave it in the comment section of this video. Let us know because this is a variable that to me is meaningful. If it wasn't meaningful, then guys wouldn't be risking their careers taking PEDs. They're taking PEDs for a reason. Understand too, everyone has the cover story thought of before they get caught, right? Whether it's tainted meat, whether it's, hey, I was taking this supplement and the label was mislabeled. They've thought it all through. Understand too, in the past, if you follow track and field, you know about the histories of people like Angel Heredia, Victor Conti, folks. <laughs> Both of them and others are now in boxing. Right? So, all I can say is you need to think about that. I know everyone's clean. Isn't everyone always clean? I can tell you. In the 1980s, we heard track and field was clean. Right? There was a moment there in the 1990s when folks were wondering whether we had juiced baseballs. Right now we know that, as Mark Grace, former first baseman, put it, he once told baseball, don't check my bat. They thought he was using a cork bat. He said, don't check my bat, check my urine. <laughs> he was joking. But his former teammate, Sammy Sosa, a guy with Hall of Fame numbers, one, is not in the Hall of Fame, two, hasn't even reconciled with the Cubs to be back at their games, three, hasn't admitted to anything. So given that these are plausible deniability times, the athlete's not going to tell you what they're taking, right? You're going to hear stuff about trainers not knowing what's in the shake that nutritionists they didn't hire gave their fighter. Right? Talented guys, James Tony failed a drug test. I'm just telling you, some major talents in the sport. Tommy Morrison was a talented guy, folks. He was a very talented guy. Right? He was also a juicer. In a sport where if you win one more round, maybe that gives you the victory over a great fighter. Right? In a sport where you have a tape of a Hall of Fame fighter, you have his trainer in the corner, 
They hand him a water bottle. He's in a spirited fight against another Hall of Fame fighter. And the trainer with the water bottle says, not that one, the one I mixed. Right? They have multiple water bottles in the corner. Why is that? Why is that? Right? In a sport where you've had, right? By the way, same trainer later, involved in a fight where padding was removed from his fighter's glove. Right? You were watching that fight and you thought, man, I didn't know Luis Resto had this kind of power. Then you find out that, of course, he didn't have the padding in his glove. In a sport where people have cut corners so many times in the past, 2020 has given the corner cutters a monumental opportunity to do just that. With this lockdown, fighters unsupervised for weeks. Right? So if a fighter is well financed, if a fighter has access to facilities, if a fighter has access to good food, not McDonald's, not Burger King, but chef prepared food, if the fighter is a self-starter, came to the sport late, has had to work for things he's gotten, is always in shape, makes weight, is adding to his game. All of those things are things all of us should consider in handicapping the fights this fall when this lockdown is lifted. That's how I see it. After I finish this video, I'm going to have to look up a map and I'm going to have to figure out, gee, was there a lockdown in this fighter's area? <laughs> it's like, where did the fighters spend the lockdown? Gee, did they have a lockdown in that country? Right? I'm going to have to figure out. You know, how does this guy live? Is he in a mansion? Understand, too, some guy named Evan Fields, look this up, Evan Fields, was getting HGH delivered to him at a Vander Hollifield's address. Hollifield at the time lived in a mansion, right? Even the guys in mansions are cutting corners. You have to figure all of that out because it might actually help swing the odds in your favor as you bet on fights. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I do like, just as a betting play, Billy Joe Saunders over Canelo. I am rolling with Joe Joyce, the underdog, over Triple D. Both unbeaten, right? But, again, this is the gambling side of the aisle. Uh, what can I say? Let me also say this, too. On Last Dance, they were talking about whether, <laughs> whether Michael Jordan had a problem gambling, right? And I understand there are people out there who do have problems gambling. I don't mean to completely laugh at addiction, right? But what I want folks to understand is making decisions based on the odds, hoping for a payoff is a part of life, right? If you're an investor, you do that with every investment. If you're a CEO and you're shepherding resources, you have to do that as it is. I don't understand this community that finds out that, let's say, a superstar athlete is betting on golf, and then they start worrying about whether he has a problem. Right. Would you rather him just blow the money on luxury items and movies? Right. Let's stop giving gambling a bad name. Not everyone who gambles has a problem. Not everyone who's making decisions on how they're going to spend their resources in the hope of getting an, a return has a problem. Right? As I was hearing the Michael Jordan story, I was laughing out loud. Right? I just thought, you've got to be kidding. This guy's a multimillionaire. It's his money. It's his decision on how to spend it. Why is anyone else involved? 
if there are folks who have concerns over the nature of this video, the fact that I'm talking about things like, hey, a fighter who is poor, who can't afford a chef, who doesn't have access to a gym during a multi-week period of a coronavirus lockdown, right, who isn't in a position to turn down a potentially financially lucrative boxing match, even if that fighter is out of shape and hasn't had a chance to spar. If someone has a problem with that, tell us about it in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.